Welcome to the Playmakers Bob Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to finish the NFL talks, the playoffs. Every team we pick to win the division, we put them in seed order, as well as pick two wildcard teams from each conference. We'll also give you our MVP choice, rookie of the year choice, and comeback of the year choice. But we all know this week is all about the college. College football kicks off tonight. And it continues all the way through Labor Day with Monday Night Football. We picking all the big games. We also giving you our college football predictions. And who will be hosting up the trophy when it's all said and done. Sit back. Enjoy. Because this is going to be a fun episode. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? It's a long process. It's a hard thought out process. Yeah, I know. I was there. I was there from March of this year thinking about how I'm going to do this, doing all my research, trying to get everything right. What platforms can we use and how we're going to record it and how we're going to make it sound good and make it all this happen. And then I came upon Anchor, the Anchor app on my phone, the easiest choice I could ever make to do a podcast. It's free to use. You don't got to pay for nothing. You can record episodes whenever you're ready. You can edit it and then you can release them when you want to. And you don't have to worry about trying to figure out how you're going to distribute it on other platforms because Anchor has partnerships with Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, CastBox, Pocket Cast, whatever you name it. Because the Playmakers Wild Podcast is the podcast that I use. We are on all them platforms. We are on nine platforms just by using the Anchor app. So pretty much all the questions that you have questions about about doing a podcast, go to the Anchor app or go to the Anchor website, anchor.fm.com and just search through it, ask questions. Because I tell you, a free app that does all this, there's nothing more you can ask for. I even got friends, they doing their podcast on the Anchor app. Faith Talk, you might have heard of it because it's very good and it's great that it's an app like this. It's a website like this that makes it easier for people to do podcasts and do what they love best, talking about the things that they love to talk about. So give Anchor a try. See how much you like it. We'll love to hear your podcast. So another edition of the Playmakers Blog Podcast. I'm your host, as you know, down there, the Playmaker Silence. I got my co-host, Dallas Glenn. How you doing, brother? Good and excited. It's finally here. What is he talking about? That college football season will begin tonight, but we have some news in the NFL, and that's what we're gonna start at. Now, the New York Jets has traded Bridgewater to the New Orleans Saints. Woo! Oh God, I'm. That doesn't affect my picks, but oh God, that wasn't even what I was talking about. Jesus, big day, week four of the preseason, huge day. The Jets have named rookie quarterback Sam Donna as the week one start on Monday night against the Detroit Lions. Well, you kind of sort of – that kind of sort of has to be expected because when you think about it, why would you trade Bridgewater knowing he needs a contract soon unless you weren't going to make your first-round pick the starter? That, that's, that doesn't really surprise me, thinking about trading Bridgewater. For me, it's kind of surprising because – they treated Josh McCown as the starter because we haven't really seen Josh McCown throughout this preseason. Yeah, that's odd, ain't it? Like, they really did, like, sit him a little bit. They sat him more, and you just saw Sam Donner and Teddy Bridgewater most of the time. So, for them to just go ahead and go with Sam Donner, it's kind of surprising. I was saying here, like, they might do Josh McCown, which is they might go the safe route and say, Josh McCown, go ahead, get, 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 get started with the team. Sam Donner sit behind him, learn. I guess they're going a different route. They're going to they go well, you know what's interesting now? It, like, if you, if you notice lately, NFL teams, it, it didn't start with the Jaguars, but, like, NFL teams, what they've been doing lately is, you know, a Chad Henney, a Ryan Fitzpatrick, a, um, a Josh McCown. If you know that you have a solid pocket passer that's gotten snaps, that's thrown passes, that started games in the NFL. Truly, when you have a rookie quarterback and a guy coming off a traumatic injury like Bridgewater, you rest 
the surefire thing. You don't want that backup getting hurt because if Sam Darnold stinks up the joint, or God forbid, if Sam Darnold gets hurt, you know that you're going to trade away Bridgewater and get as much as you can. So you really need to make sure that, like, that backup quarterback, because let's be honest, I mean, it's not like McCown isn't practicing. He He's probably gotten first-team snaps in practice. He's probably gotten, like, elite second-team snaps. He's gotten the snaps he needs. They're probably just making sure that the preseason doesn't rear its ugly head because that's when the Jets are in trouble if they were to lose a surefire backup quarterback like McCown. Because when you think of the Jets' offense – it doesn't really need a lot to maintain and keep going. The Jets' offense is about as bland and vanilla as you can get, really. That's true. That's true. And I agree with you on that. But, you know, we're we going to see how, how it works out in week one. Monday night, the lights on bright. In Detroit, the other big news, Aaron Rodgers is a million-dollar man getting $100 million guaranteed money. Yes, that also comes the same day they trade away his backup. So just like the Patriots last year, the Packers are going all in. It's it's one hundred million in guarantees. They it's the Green Bay Packers. You already know that the Green Bay Packers don't do free agency. When you do a hundred million dollars in guarantees, unless that's one big old sign in bonus, the Packers are basically saying Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers alone is going to take us to the promised land. Aaron Rodgers is the best player in football, bar none, period. We're going to pay him like it, and he's going to be worth every penny. Because when you trade your backup too, and you trade your backup to a team that's been a thorn in your side, oof, that's that's a lot of faith. Well, ladies and gentlemen who don't know you, they traded Brent Huntley to the Seattle Seahawks to be Russell Wilson's backup quarterback. So the NFL's been been full of moves today, and we're gonna stick with the NFL because we're gonna get down to the real thing that y'all want to hear us talk about. Now we're gonna rank our division picks in the seating order, and then we're gonna pick two wild card teams. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with the AFC side. I got the Pittsburgh Steelers coming out as the first seed, New England Patriots coming in the second seed, the Houston Texans as the third seed. And the LA Chargers has the fourth seed. That's okay. what you're talking uh, Believe it or not, we, we weren't that far off division wise. I got Patriots first, Pitt second, but to be honest, that's interchangeable. Those two franchises know what to do in the regular season. I got Jaguars third, Oakland fourth. So we were round about the same like AFC South third, AFC West fourth, then Pitt and Patriots getting the bye weeks. So, you know. Thing about these wild cards, man. Uh, I, I was Ravens, the Tennessee Titans, the Jacksonville Jaguars, Kansas City Chiefs, Denver Broncos, Oakland Raiders, and you can only pick two. So I went with Jacksonville getting the first wild card and the Ravens getting the second wild card. That might be shocking to people, but I think the Ravens gonna have a bounce back season, and they will do enough to get into the playoffs. You know, I wouldn't be surprised, but, um, like, really thinking about it the past couple of days, I know that right now it's, it's Jacksonville and Tennessee, to me, that are the best teams in that division. And when you really think about it, one of, one of those teams has to win. So who are the best second-place finishers in the AFC? And I'm, I'm with you. Like, I know the AFC South is going to have one of the best second-place finishers. And I know the West, and I know the Ravens. But I'm thinking that, you know, Kansas City, yeah, they have a new quarterback. But they – um, Andy Reid, he, he's he's a quarterback whisperer. If there's one coach who can get a, a young quarterback right, and then he has Tyreek Hill as another weapon, and he has that defense. I'm, I'm thinking Kansas City will get that sixth seed. And I'm thinking Tennessee will get the fifth seed. I think Tennessee – continues what they were doing. I don't know if Mike Vrabel is going to be able to be that coaching oomph that the franchise really thinks in his first year, but I think he does enough to not mess up what he already has. Young, big bruiser running back that can eat the clock and help Mariota. Franchise quarterback who's finally been there before. I, I think that they, um, if they don't win the division, I definitely think they're like a 10-win team who easily gets the fifth seed. Now, I know everybody's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Darnell, you got the pitchers going second. Why? 
I'm saying that that four game suspension of Julian Edelman is gonna hurt them in the long run. Yeah. He's missing the first four games with week two being in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And Danny Amendola's in Miami. Those were. So, I'm just saying, like, missing those four games going to be causing. You got Houston to open up the season. And that's my LC South Division pick. Yeah. That's two games already. And then the other two is what? You're at Detroit on a Sunday night. You're going against Matt Patricia, who used to be the defensive coordinator over in New England. Yeah. And then you got Miami to finish out the four game suspension. So. I'm and, saying, and, and you know, in support of your point too, man. Like, you know, even though I have them first, it's kind of sort of like the Aaron Rodgers effect. I believe Brady and Rodgers, as long as they're on the field, their teams are going to be top contenders. But to your point, man, like, you know, the Patriots are consistently fielding a 22nd or worse ranked defense. Like, you can do the whole points allowed and stuff like that, and that's all well and good. But when you really look at the raw total statistics of a Patriots defense especially at 2011 defense that was 31st, the Patriots usually field a bad offense. So you're talking about going against a 5,000-yard passer with some weapons and Matt Stafford. You're talking about going against a pass rush when you already lost your first-round draft pick or second-round draft pick and win. And the Texans, I mean, everybody's going to be healthy week one. I mean, so, you know, it's, 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 it's to your point, man. Like, when you talk about the bye weeks in the AFC, you're talking about 12 wins or more. That's a minimum. That's just to have a shot. Realistically, you're talking 13, 3, 14, and 2 are going to get the bye weeks and home field advantage in the AFC. So, I'm, I, like I said, I'm not really – I don't really have much to disagree with as far as, like, divisions go because I feel like, like, you, like you're saying, the Patriots could get second. It's just when I look at Pittsburgh, I – obviously they had a huge loss in Shay's ear. Like, you know, we're worried about him off the field, and we're glad that he can walk and that he's healthy and everything. But, you know, just being real, on the field, he was probably their best linebacker. <clears throat> you know, when it comes to defense, the Pittsburgh Steelers, this is one of their, not weaker, but this is one of their younger, like, non-identity defenses in a minute. You look across that Steelers defense, it doesn't feel like a Steelers defense. Now, even though their offense has Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell, and can put up points left and right, I feel like their shootout offense, which is like the most high-flying offense really in Steelers history when you think about it, I think that's to compensate for the youth on the defense. But it's an offensive league. So I think that's why Pitt at least gets a bye week. Because whether it's Pitt first or Pitt second, I just think that, you know, they made the adaptation. They knew that being the old-school Steelers in the long run wasn't going to cut it. As we, as we recap, I got the Steelers at the nine feet. I got the Pitchers the two seed. Houston the three. Chargers the four. Jacksonville the fifth. Ravens the six. And who are your AOC teams? Mine are Patriots, uh, Steelers, Jaguars, Raiders, Titans, and Chiefs. That's the AOC oh. side. On the NFC side, I'm going to let Dallas go ahead and start that off. All right. I got Eagles at one, Saints at two. And then three and four is really a toss-up for me. I've got Green Bay or the L.A. Rams being either three or four. Then, because I figured at the end of Seaside, we were going to have a lot of discussion. My first choices are Carolina and ATL. I think those are the safest picks. I think Carolina's coming in with a really good defense at preseason. I think Cam Newton's healthy and ready to go. And Matt Ryan is Matt Ryan. I just find it hard to believe that in the NFL and with these new rules, Matt Ryan won't find a way to win nine games and get a six seed. My second choices, though, are Minnesota and Dallas. And we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, as we let go. So who are your picks in the NFC? Choosing this side is was really difficult. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking at all the division picks that I picked, and I'm like, I don't know how to rank them. I really don't. So when it got down to it, the the defending Super Bowl champ, Philadelphia Eagles, that's my one seed. Okay. The LA Rams, that's the two seed. New Orleans, that's the three seed. Green Bay, that's the four seed. And then I can't leave Atlanta out of that. They got my first wild card. The Super Bowl's in Atlanta. They had a down year last year, and they still make the playoffs. 
I'm like, I'm looking for Atlanta to do to try to make try to be that first team to get to the Super Bowl when it's in their home. They might not make it, but I'm looking for them to make that run. And then my second wild card team, we was in the same boat, but I went with the New York Giants. Oh, Giants. I went to the Giants. You know that okay, so you know, now that we gotten the six picks out the way. With the Giants, you do understand that they have to go over the Eagles and the Cowboys. Everybody's healthy on the Cowboys. No major but, people are suspended. Even Randy Gregory in the pass rush is back. Yeah, I know. But remember when I when we first talked about this, I said that last game between the Giants and the Cowboys will be fighting for a playoff spot. Okay. I'm picking the Giants to win that game. And okay. they get in that way. They beat the Cowboys to get in the playoff. And it's in New York, week 17. Mm, mm. So I'm going on one with the G-Man. Okay. Now that's now that's really interesting. Cause like I'm looking, I'm like, okay, so me and you kind of have the same idea. Cause like, you know, we we both agree that Dallas and New York are gonna be playing for that playoff spot. So basically you're picking New York and I'm picking Dallas. That's pretty much it. I, don't, yeah. I just feel like now that they, they have a running back and say Cron Barkley, Oda Beckham got paid. His aid. He's going to be there, so he should be happy and he should be playing because we know how receivers get. They still got 30 Sterling Shepard. I feel like they're going to have a better season. They tied in. Ingram will have a better season. Eli will have a better season. Yeah. The defense is good. They just – they were just on the field for too long. I don't think that would be the case this year. Yeah. So, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the Giants on this one. I mean, hey, dude, I, like the recurring theme is you can play offense or you can play defense. Special teams is all well and good, but at the end of the day, it just either helps your offense or your defense. In the NFL, the ways that the rule have been going, the way that tradition has been going, if you have a quarterback, you have a chance. Now, if you have a quarterback and a running back and some receivers, well, shoot, all you got to do is just make sure you don't allow 28 points a game. 28 points in the NFL, in theory, should win you a lot of games. If your defense just has to make sure they don't allow four touchdowns, that, that's 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 really the the crude math of it. Do the New York Giants have a defense that cannot allow four touchdowns per game? If they can prevent four touchdowns per game, I'm with you. I don't see why the Giants aren't a playoff team on paper. Experienced quarterback who's definitely going to go to the Hall of Fame. Uh, wide receiver definitely going to go to the Hall of Fame. Highly touted running back. Good role players. Decent offensive line. They hey. They just need to allow less than four touchdowns a game, and they should be able to get it done. But um, hmm, so, so you're kind of okay. So what what do you feel about Minnesota? Was it just Carolina, Atlanta, and Dallas? I mean, and New York was just too good for you to put them over, or do you think Minnesota just doesn't have the juice? Uh, while I'm looking at it, I'm thinking somewhere down the line, Kirk Cousins. It's not going to be that 84 guaranteed dollar man that they want him to be. I think he'll start off good, but as the season starts to wane down and you starting to see who who's really battling, I think Kirk Cousins is going to, it's going to fall off. I can see that. Detroit, I like Matthew Stafford. It's Matt Patricia's first year as head coach. So it's going to take time for him to get the kind of defense he wants. And I think at the end, Matthew Stafford can't outscore everybody in the league. Uh-uh. So at some point, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna lose games at down the line. It's gonna be heartbreaking losses. I already said I got the Giants beating the Cowboys. That's how they get in. So Dallas is eliminated. Carolina. I wanted to put Carolina in there, but for some reason I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about I'm thinking that's the fact by Atlanta getting in. That's what gets Carolina knocked out. Mm. That's what I'm thinking. Because I really wanted to put Carolina in, but I think the Falcons, knowing that the Super Bowl's in their backyard. They can be the first team to do it. They can finally get that Super Bowl taste out their mouth because they want to. To be honest, that was that's kind of how I feel. Their season was last year. It, it was all about the Super Bowl, and they never got over that. So I think they can finally get that taste out their mouth. They can see in the future the Super Bowl is in our backyard. We can get there, and that's gonna propel them over Carolina. Okay. So with the Rams in New Orleans, is defense the difference in the order that you have them? Defense and same thing with what I said about the New England Patriots and Julian Ellen being suspended. 
Mike Ingram being suspended for four games, it's gonna have it's gonna have probably a game difference effect on New Orleans. That would allow the Rams to have a, a game better than New Orleans because it's that that was my that was my hardest pick because you pretty much talking about two teams and they scheduled you, they played as about everybody in the NFC East that's been a top notch team, but the fact that the Rams doesn't have nobody important suspended and New Orleans does, I think one of those games. What helped the Rams get the second seed and New Orleans get the third seed? Now, um, how how close – it'll be Thursday when we drop this, but how close now are the Rams with Aaron Donald? From what Sean McVay has been saying, very optimistic. they thinking that by the end of the week, by sometime probably Friday or during the weekend, Aaron Donald should probably sign his new contract. So now, it's looking I like he think- could be there for week one against Oakland on Monday night. How do you think Geno Atkins' deal is going to affect – this negotiation now because I think that Geno Atkins waited this long trying to see like if Aaron Donald would get his done first. Khalil Matt too because Khalil Matt still hasn't signed a new deal and he's still holding out on Oakland so it's a it's a it's a lot of waiting going on around here but from what I've seen in the third preseason game against Houston and they first team in that defense that defense is sick then once Aaron Donald signs and you add Aaron Donald to that defense is even more sick. So I think it's, it's, it's like 90% closer getting done with Aaron Donald than it is with Khalil Mack. And See, then with Atkins getting his deal, now it's like, I don't think it has no effect because I think they already had the numbers already set in stone. I think there was just, uh, some of the languages, some of how the years are working out. But I think the number was already done. I think that's why that the Khalil Mack situation is so much more sour from the outside looking in. Because Khalil Mack is an outside linebacker hybrid pass rusher. Aaron Donald, let's be honest, I'm not saying he's an overachiever defensive tackle, but when you think of a defensive tackle, when you really think of, okay, even if I draft a pass rushing defensive tackle, if I draft a pass rushing defensive tackle, I'm still only expecting 9.5 sacks, maybe, because he's a D tackle. I think that's kind of odd that, like, you know, Khalil Mack's deal is hinging upon. Aaron Donald's because at the end of the day you put Aaron Donald on the edge he's only six feet you're talking about going to get six seven 320 330 pound D tackles and even though he goes against guards he's going against guards and centers centers are usually the lightest on the offensive line and the smallest he's he's faster he has the the quicker build like now that and Dominican Sue he won't be getting double teamed as much but it's like it's it's odd I think that that's one of those things where you know I don't know where it's going to be a bottom feeder team. It's going to be a team like, you know, San Francisco, Arizona, maybe Indianapolis. It's going to be a team that doesn't have a lot of pieces, but has the cap room because I just, it, they're both pass rushers, but they, they don't, they're not the same. Aaron Donald is basically being the successor to JJ Watt because JJ Watt's winding down. Aaron Donald's going to be that interior lineman. Where like you know the Warren Saps, um, Marcus Stroud, <clears throat> Marcus Stroud, Marcel Darius when he first got in the league, you know, it, it's believe it or not in this NFL and the way college football is, it's rare to find that sub three hundred pound pass rushing defensive tackle. It, it's not as it's not as common as some people may think. So I think that you know I think at at the crux of it, man, I think his Khalil Max agents. I think they get that. <clears throat> you know, when you think of Khalil Mack, you're thinking Sean Merriman, Lawrence Taylor, um, Simeon Rice, My, uh, Michael Strahan, um, Terrell Suggs. You're thinking like, you know, put him in a 3-4, Joker. Put him in a 4-3, you know, right defensive end. Like, it, it's not the same. So it's probably an irreparable situation. Because you got a coach like John Gruden and an owner like Mark Davis. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that business acumen gets done. It's unfortunate because, I mean, the Raiders, that's going to be a big hole. I think if Khalil Mack doesn't come back next year, it's going to be a completely different Raiders team because I don't think they have an offense like New Orleans or the Giants to compensate for a defense that allows four touchdowns or more a game. I mean, if Khalil Mack doesn't show up for the season, especially for that opener, I think Oakland's going to have a hard time with the Rams, a very hard time. Oh, dude, I mean, you know, not to not to shoot down your shit, but they don't have Khalil Mack. They're going to have a hard time with everybody. 
They Derek Carr is a franchise quarterback. He he is a franchise quarterback. He is definitely one of the best 100 players in the league. He's young. He has time. But we're talking about Dan Marino with the Dolphins kind of ineptitude and just hopelessness if they can't prove that, okay, when our elite players come due, we're going to keep those pieces around for Derek. Because think about it. Amari Cooper, he stayed relatively healthy. Amari Cooper has been producing. I think he just had a contract either next year or last year. But wide receivers, when that third contract comes due, look at Des Bryant. That's basically what happened. If Amari Cooper is asking too high and he doesn't want to do a Larry Fitzgerald type of deal, now you're talking about his running back will be gone because Marshawn Lynch ain't going to play in Las Vegas. I think you already said that. His running back will be gone. Receiver might be gone. And then an elite Hall of Fame pass rusher will be gone. What pieces will he have? It's going to be interesting. We're, we're about a week away from the start of the NFL season. So you heard our playoff teams real quickly. Um, I got Deshaun Watson and Tom Brady battling for MVP. Ooh. I'm saying Deshaun Watson will probably be the comeback player of the year, depending on what happens with Carson Wentz in Philly. Mm. And I'm saying Saquon Barkley will be the rookie of the year. Ooh. What do you think? To be honest, I, I, I just find it weird that Aaron Rodgers is being nicked up so much over the past couple of seasons. I think this is a season where he stays healthy. I think they figure it out. They figure out what they got to do, how they have to protect him, how they have to treat him in the training room. I think that Aaron Rodgers is MVP this year because I think that the combination of him getting hurt last year and then this money deal, I don't think that the Green Bay Packers, even though they don't like to go through free agency, I don't think that the Green Bay Packers would have had Brett Hundley and Deshaun Kaiser on the roster, two young quarterbacks who've barely gotten snaps in the league, giving him that kind of money unless the physicals and stuff came back right. I think Aaron Rodgers stays healthy. I think he balls out. He could easily be comeback player of the year when you think about it. But I think he stays healthy, and I think he's a clear MVP. I think Tom Brady has that LeBron James effect. I think people have gotten so accustomed to Brady being at the top that they don't realize just how awesome of a statistical season he's having at any given time. So I think that if Aaron Rodgers stays healthy, it's not even an MVP race. I think he just wins it outright. So okay. I got Aaron Rodgers as my MVP pick. Okay. Well, who, who is your rookie of the year and comeback player? I think comeback – I think Deshaun's a good pick for comeback. I think Deshaun's going to be comeback. And for my offensive rookie, I'm thinking – I'm actually going to go quarterback. I'm just okay. thinking which quarterback. Hmm. I think that I think that Sam Darnold might win rookie of the year. He's going I, with the Jets QB. And once again, I'm saying that because not that the Bills have a crazy complicated offense. I'm just looking at it and it's like, okay, the Jets scheme doesn't need elite weapons. I think that for Saquon Barkley to get offensive rookie of the year as a running back he's gonna have to do a lot he's gonna have to catch up the backfield and he's gonna have like 1200 plus yards because you look at Leonard Fournette last year and Kamara beat him who was a running back but when you look at what Kamara did Kamara was that much better than Mark Ingram but Kamara was also on a team with Drew Brees and everything like Leonard Fournette when you think about offensive rookie And how did he affect his team? How did his team go? If it was offensive rookie MVP, it should have been Fournette. But Kamara did that much. Can Saquon Barkley do that much with Eli and Odell on the same team? Just when you look at um, Sam Darnold, it's like Josh Rosen, um, he's on the Bills. Then, you know, Josh Allen, God bless him, he's – He's on some kind of revenge tour, but he's in Arizona, so he can have fun with that. Um, so, you know, it's simple offensive system. You're not expected to do much. You're expected to compete for a wild card spot because New England's in your division. So off rip, it's like he doesn't have to win the division. His offense is catered towards him learning on the go. I think if he can break 3,000, 3,200 yards, 
and can throw 20 touchdowns and keep his picks around 15 or 16, and the Jets can finish with, like, you know, a winning record and either get the sixth seed or just miss the playoffs, I think he gets rookie of the year. All right, there you have it. One week from today, it's the opening kickoff. Atlanta Falcons at the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll be back. All right. Now let's get down to the big news of the week. College football has arrived. Yes, Lord. Starting tonight, all the way through Monday, college football is taking over. Now to big recap. Me and Dallas both pick Oklahoma to come out of the Big Ten, the Big Twelve. Excuse me. Uh-huh. Clemson come out of the ACC. He has Miami come out of the ACC. Yeah. He has Ohio State come out of the Big Ten, despite what's been happening with Urban Myers. I'm going with Wisconsin out of the Big Ten. We both uh-huh. got Alabama coming out of the SEC, and we both got Washington coming out of the Pac-12. So yeah. Dallas, uh-huh. question that people want to know. Who are you putting in the playoffs? All right. So, do you want to? Can I give context? Or you want me to just say it, then we give context later. However, you feel. All right. So, four. Taking everything into consideration, everything into consideration, I've got Ohio State at four. I, when we talked in that episode, I picked Ohio State really out of spite and skepticism more so than how I think they'll perform on the field. It turns out my spite and skepticism was warranted because if you really look at the details of Urban Meyer's three-game suspension, he can still be around the team during the week. Also, if I remember my facts correctly, I think Brett McMurphy or another credible reporter reported that three members of the board of trustees at Ohio State were on the quote-unquote independent committee. So that being said, I really don't think that the interim coach can do much to mess it up against Rutgers and Oregon State. And I think me and you both agreed on one loss, Big Ten team can get in. So you're talking about maybe slipping up against TCU, but I doubt that too. So Ohio State I have at four. I've got Washington at three. I've got Miami at two because of what they would have to do to even win the ACC in the first place. And then I got Alabama at one. Almost similar again. Why we did in the NFL? I'm going to shot some people, though. Number one, the Clemson Tigers. Okay. The same reason why you got Miami in the number two. The reason why I got Clemson in number one. The, what they got to go through. And for them... So make it out of there. I got them number one. Okay. I got Alabama number two. To be honest, Ty fans, I don't think Clemson's going undefeated, and I don't think Alabama's going undefeated. Yeah, there's going to be one of, them, one of them world games. They go, Alabama gets caught, and it might be against LSU. Because it's in Death Valley. Yeah, I mean, LSU is overdue. They're way overdue. Like, that might that might just be it. But I'm saying they're going to win the conference. They'll get into the playoffs for sure. They'll be the number two seed. Number three, I got the Wisconsin Badgers. I think this might be the year where a team that nobody really, a team that's not really big known gets in because they proved it on the field week after week after week, and that's Wisconsin. As some people will say, Wisconsin is the SEC team that's inside the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. They play defense. They run the ball. I'm looking at Wisconsin. At number four, I got the Washington Huskies. I think they'll survive the Pac-12. As interesting that comes with it, I think they'll survive it enough to where all the other teams will slip up and they'll allow Washington to get in. So, me and you agree that no Big 12 champion is going to get in this year. I say no Big 12 champion gets in, and I say and I say no repeat for the Southeastern Conference. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a Southeastern Conference boy. I love them for the Gators, but I'm saying Alabama gets in. I don't think Georgia gets in. I don't think nobody else from the ACC gets in on this one. 
I think this one's going to be an all, a all conference championship playoff this year. Because mm. I think I think now everybody knows just because you win your conference doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get into the playoff. So everybody's on alert now. Not only do I want to win my conference, but I want to make sure with no doubt everybody know I'm one of the best four teams in the Yeah. And Oklahoma, <clears throat> I mean, me, me and you, me and you agree. The ACC champion and the Pac-12 champion, their strength of schedule is going to be ridiculous. Big 12, you really got three teams. TCU, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. And Oklahoma State, I mean, what have they done lately? They had that one great year with Brandon Whedon and Justin Blackman. But when you really think about the BCS era, when you think about the college football playoff era, they've been good. They've been exciting, but they they haven't been able to pull the trigger. And Mike Gundy's been there for a long time to still not be getting it done. Same thing with TCU. TCU was dominating the group of five. For them to still look like they're on the bubble, they're like they're still on the cusp, it's too long. Three, four years in a big five conference and you're and you're good enough to finish third and fourth all the time. That's that's not going to cut it, man. Oklahoma is not that good. So, I, I'm, I'm with that. I, I We both know the SEC champion automatically gets a big. That's like automatic. Yeah. It's just we're picking Alabama to win the conference is the problem. Like, you know, if, if God, God forbid, if Kentucky won the SEC, they're putting Kentucky in. It just means Alabama will have to knock out Ohio State or Wisconsin. So, I mean, you know, we are both picking Alabama to win. I think everybody in the preseason is picking Alabama to win, unless you live in Gainesville or unless you live in Baton Rouge. Unless you live in the city of a known rival to Alabama, nobody's picking other than Alabama to win the conference, which is why we only have one SEC SEC team making the playoff this year. You know, I think think Georgia would have been his fifth. Because I think Georgia will probably be that much better. Yeah. And then the yeah. talent from the other team in that East has gotten okay. better. So. Let me let me tell you my New Year's six teams. I don't know which bowls they're gonna get, but let me just tell you the teams I got. I got Clemson, UCF, Stanford, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Notre Dame as my New Year's six bowl teams. So your group of five pick is UCF. Yep. I mean, Boise State, people don't understand. Boise State has San Diego State, um, I think Colorado State. Fresno State. Fresno State. I um, think they play Utah State. Yeah, like people don't understand, man. Like the Mountain West is this close to saying, hey, UCF and, o- UCF and Houston and Navy, they ain't good every year. We're time and time and again kicking out a 10-win team. We're time and time again kicking out somebody finishing the final 25. We're time and time again kicking out somebody that can beat a bottom feeder power five team. The Mountain West is a difficult conference. And Boise State isn't Boise State right now. They're good. They're stable. They're they're doing good. They're doing steady. But they're not the Boise State of old. They're not. They're not doing what UCF did last year and against Baylor in the Fiesta Bowl in 2013. They're not that Boise State right now. So that's why I got UCF coming out the group of five. Their conference is easier. They only really got to worry about Houston, and I think that's the conference championship game. Navy's in the slump, and USF. USF is USF. They don't got Corey Flowers no more. So uh, we'll see how that quarterback situation plays out at UCF. I'm looking at, I got to admit, I'm going UCF. I admit, a little bias on it. But I'm going UCF. And I think UCF meant this in a rematch for the American Conference. Mm. Don't see, don't forget about Memphis. Memphis has, has, a, has a team. So I think they'll meet each other again for the American Conference. I think UCF will probably pull that one through. But like you said, the the mountain, the mountain West, 
Jeez, San Diego State, Fresno State, Boise State, Utah State. Oh, boy. and all of them, all of them playing the Pac-12 team within the first three weeks. So you talking about they already come by the time they play each other, they already been battle tested. Yeah, like I mean, you know, I think it's a battle of attrition because when you think of UCF, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been doing my due diligence. I haven't been keeping up with the UCF blogs or anything. But here's what UCF has to do in theory. UCF has to figure out a way to trust their quarterback enough to throw the ball. When you look at the UCF teams that have won major bowls against power five teams, they've had a quarterback that could go out there and throw the rock and compete. Blake Bortles put up 52 against Baylor. And I think that there was a shootout. I think we're talking like 40 plus that UCF put up against Auburn to win the Peach Bowl. So UCF is a college team where their identity is we have a quarterback, he's going to throw it. I think that UCF, I think that any college team, but I think UCF, all things considered, I think they're focused on keeping the ship rolling. When you look at the American Conference, you have Connecticut, you have USF, you have Houston, you have Navy, and you have UCF. Connecticut and USF are not national. They're not national programs. Not right now. Navy, the personnel that they have to choose from because of their unique situation and the triple offense works against them. Basically, what's been happening is every time Navy plays Houston, you know, Houston just, they, they, they can score more points than them. Houston and UCF have just been thorns in the side of Navy because Navy can't put up points like that. And they just don't have the recruits to have an elite defense. So you take out Navy. Now you're talking Houston. Mm, I mean, they have an elite track team, but it ain't like every track member is playing football and playing receiver and corner. It's one of those things where when you look at Houston, you look at Memphis and you look at UCF, it's basically the same situations. Their quarterbacks aren't stars when the season starts. And, you know, they just they, – they develop as the season goes. Again, you know, me and you have said it over and over, because Memphis, Houston, and UCF are always coin flips and you have to see how the season goes, that's why an American team is going to get the group of five. The Mountain West is just too hard. So, but all right, so, so tell me who you got. I got UCF. Making an, another New Year's decision, right? You know, yeah. I asked, Georgia would finish fifth in the in the final polls, so they'll be in the New Year's Six Bowl. Yeah, I think Penn State would be in the New Year's Six Bowl because I got them losing to Wisconsin in the Big Ten championship game. Okay, so Oklahoma would get a New Year's Six Bowl because let's be let's be real, like it's Oklahoma. Okay. So you and then possibly you can I can see you USC you probably get getting one. Okay. By by them finishing second and losing to Washington in the Pac twelve. Okay. So but I can I can see UCF going against probably Georgia in the Peach Bowl. So is so is Peach Bowl basically group of five SEC? Is that the agreement? It's SEC for sure, but the group of five, they can go. They can probably go into any bowl. It depends on where they feel like putting them at. All right. So, all right. So let, let let me get my math right. Right now, I have five bowl games, and I'm leaving the national championship open in the playoff. That's the correct math, right? The six bowls are the five regular bowls in the national championship, right? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Because I'm looking, it's like, okay, I got Stanford, which is one of the Pac-12 team. I got Clemson, which is one of the ACC team. I've got one of the big, big. T- See, here's here's what's tricky to me, Darnell. <sighs> Notre Dame is an independent. And yes, Notre Dame has the money. Yes, they have the NBC deal. I understand all this. I get it. But Darnell. I, I feel like this season I have to give Notre Dame the Chargers truth. If you look at Notre Dame's schedule, every year, every year, if you look at Notre Dame's schedule, 
they have a schedule where if they can just go 11 and one, they're going to get a major bowl game. I, I, I feel like it's one of those laws of numbers thing. Like, you know, Brian Kelly, he's been there. Notre Dame, they get the best recruits. Notre Dame doesn't have the Ohio State and Penn State situations. They don't have the Florida situations. They don't have um, the Baylor situations. Like Notre Dame, even though it's Notre Dame and nobody's perfect, Notre Dame, usually they're they're independent. They're always independent. And they kind of just, you know, mind their business and schedule the hardest schedule where you know you have to win every game. It's weird to me because it's like I know that we have Oklahoma picked to win the Big 12. And I know that me and you really only have basically a, a major five teams and UCF. Do you feel like it's a strong debate if somebody were to pick Notre Dame over Oklahoma to get a New Year's Six Bowl if Notre Dame were to have only one loss? Because I don't think Oklahoma goes undefeated. I don't think it'll be between Oklahoma and Notre Dame. I think it'll be Notre Dame. It'll be between Notre Dame and whoever the group of five is. Well, no, because the group of five is guaranteed as long as they're the highest ranked group of five. At Notre, first. Notre Dame has that. Notre Dame has that weird grandfather clause. Like out of all the independent teams, Notre Dame is different. I think Army and BYU count as group of five teams, but Notre Dame doesn't. Notre Dame can make the playoffs if they go undefeated this year. Yeah, if they go undefeated, that's a Mike and Winch in our system right now. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you have to remember, even though they got their asses stunk, they went battle game against Alabama that year as a straight-up independent, really because they're Notre Dame. And they was undefeated. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's the thing. Like, that's the thing that people have to understand. There's an undefeated Notre Dame, then there's a one loss Notre Dame. Is a one loss Notre Dame with the schedule that they have worse than Stanford losing the Pac 12? Worse than Wisconsin losing the Big Ten? Is a one loss Notre Dame really worse than a Big 12 champion Oklahoma? Because remember, in this era, we've had conference champions not go to the playoffs. So it's like if Penn State wasn't better than Ohio State and they won the Big Ten Conference that year, who's to say that a one-loss Notre Dame with the schedule they have isn't better than an Oklahoma Big 12 team that has the weakest Power 5 conference of everybody? We'll see. As they open up their season at home with a renewed rivalry with those big blue of Michigan Wolverines, and that that's that, that's a perfect example. That's when first off, literally by default, every game for Notre Dame is an out of conference game. <laughs> literally by default, it's, it's oof. when you open up like that. You got some teams opening up against HBCUs. You got some teams opening up against cupcakes in the power in the group of five conferences. You got some teams opening up against one double A schools. I mean, come on, man. Notre Dame's coming out the box hot. We, yeah, we, we, but let's get back to the playoffs because uh, it's interesting because you have Alabama 1, Ohio State 4 that will play each other. And then on the other side, you have Miami and Washington. Now, we've seen this number one Alabama versus number four Ohio State before. Does this repeat in your opinion? This year, No. We have to really go back and put on our historian hats and remember that they had the three quarterback problem back then. They had a quarterback that could play receiver and start at receiver. They had one quarterback that was a dual threat, and they had one quarterback that was a big old pocket passer. Then they had weapons on top of that. I think they had um not Mike Smith. His name escapes me, but they had like an elite receiver that was like a first round NFL prospect. Um they had some uh, some pretty decent defensive players. I mean, they was wait wasn't Joey Bosa on that team? I think Joey Bosa was on that team. Yeah, so when you think about it, man, like you know, it's a different Ohio State, man. Like I'm not saying Ohio State doesn't have weapons. I'm not saying that Urban Meyer doesn't recruit, but you know, Nick Saban, he's Nick Saban. Alabama, you're talking about Alabama now. I think that was Jalen Hurts. 
first year when they lost against Ohio State. Now you're talking about an Alabama that has a quarterback that outright beat Jalen Hurd for the starting job in a half of football. So you add an actual quarterback plus the rest of Alabama's team. Then you got Urban Meyer. It, it, it worries me when a coach, a head coach, is going to go to the lengths that Urban Meyer did to not only protect an assistant coach, but make sure he can take him everywhere he goes, knowing his track record. It's, it's one thing when you protect a player. It's one thing when you do that. It's another thing when it's like, wait a minute, so you mean to tell me that that assistant coach was that good? That assistant coach was such a strong part of your program. It irks me and it bothers me because it's like, you know, well, you know, they might win the Big Ten because Ohio State is Ohio State. And and what is Wisconsin? Let's be honest. What has Wisconsin done to prove they can pull the trigger? They got they got they've got coaching turnover. I mean, you know, no team really besides Michigan State and Northwestern in the Big Ten really kept their coach for the most part, and Penn State really keeps their coaches for the most part. So the safe pick is Ohio State. The second safe pick is Penn State. That being said, there's a difference between safe pick and they can beat Alabama. I don't think anybody from Big Ten is going to be Alabama. I think Wisconsin will put up a good fight, but that's because they'll keep the ball away. I don't think the Big Ten champion beats Alabama. I agree with you, because that's my first round matchup. Alabama and Wisconsin. I think I think that might be the first playoff game that you see an old-fashioned fight and who comes out on top in a tough battle. And yeah, Alabama's good for it. Better than Wisconsin. Yeah, like, you know, Alabama, they've, they've got the NFL defense, the NFL offensive line, and they got a quarterback, and they got receivers who the quarterback can throw it to. When you look at Wisconsin, they're straight eye form. Their eye form and their defense brings their lunch pail. Their defense ain't nothing to call home about, and their running game ain't nothing complex. Wisconsin, what makes them special is you know what they're going to do. You just can't stop it. Alabama, they're literally an NFL team running a pro-style offense. You're essentially playing against an NFL team. You're playing against an NFL training camp roster when you play Alabama. You got you got to have a lot going for you to beat Alabama. And then on the second side, on the other side, I got Clemson versus Washington. That would be a great matchup to see. ACC champion versus Washington is going to be a high flyer. I'm thinking over under, I'm going over 50 points. That's going to be a high flyer. And I think Clemson will pull, I think Clemson will pull away late in the fourth quarter. So that'll leave me with Alabama and Clemson yet again for another national championship. But let's get to your other side, because your other side, you got Miami and Washington. And and here's the and here's the tricky part with me, because like you know, Miami, Mark Rick's second year. Honeymoon year, the Miami culture is starting to come back, turnover chain and all that. I mean, Miami is returning a lot of people. And Mark Rick, as a coach, it didn't matter if his whole roster was graduating. Mark Rick proved at Georgia in the hardest conference in all of college football that he can deal with turnover. He can keep Georgia. Like, people forget Mark Rick at Georgia never really lost more than three games. He he was always in the mix somehow. If he had a year where he lost one or three games, it was truly a bad year. So when you think about it, it's like, okay, teams coming back, all that, what they would have to do to win the ACC. Washington has been there before, but I don't know if Washington has the firepower to beat a Miami that beat Clemson for the conference. And also, let's not forget FSU. We don't mean neither me or you think that FSU will finish higher than third. But you know, it, the ACC isn't as easy as the Big 12 basically. I think that Miami can probably beat Washington. I don't know what it is. I know Oregon did pretty good the first year. I don't know when a Pac-12 team it's really going to look like they can win a national title. It feels like it's been forever since a Pac-12 team won a national title. Now, I'll say this. 
if Stanford wins the Pac-12, I can see Stanford going over Miami or Clemson. But for whatever reason, even though we both think that Washington's the overall better team, I don't know. It's it's weird. I, I don't see Washington beating Miami. I do, however, see Alabama beating her brakes off of Miami. <laughs> that was going to be my next question because you got Miami and Alabama for the national title, and you just said Alabama. That's going to be at least a two-score difference. So I got Rick, Alabama. I mean, Mark Rick has played in the SEC. He had all his chances in the world. <sighs> Yo, I, I feel for him. I feel like Miami, Alabama, Mark Rick having such extensive experience being in the SEC should help him. But that's where that experience comes into play. Washington, if people remember, if people be fair and objective and remember, Washington in the BCS era, they weren't as bad as their cousin Washington State, but they they weren't Oregon. When you really think about Washington's run right now, they're kind of sort of the Oregon of the college football playoff era, but they're they're just not as good. Washington is always going to be in the mix, but um, I uh. Uh-uh. That being said, I, I feel for Mark Rick. He he's he's gonna get so close. Yeah, he's gonna be so far. Does that ain't no way on God's earth he's beating Alabama. Not this year. See, I got Clemson and Alabama. And every time these two get together, it's an instant classic. And I'm thinking there's gonna be another instant classic. Oh, it's gonna be a good one. But I think this time with Alabama having a quarterback now. I think this time they edge out Clemson for the national championship mm. instead of the Clemson quarterback edging Alabama for the title like Deshaun Watson did. And that's another thing we have to remember. Clemson has had a really great run with quarterbacks. If I remember correctly, it was Taj Boyd, then Deshaun Watson, right? Yep. So I remember last year, and it, I, I think it, we can both agree they got an issue at quarterback. Now, it's not fair because you're talking Taj Boyd and Deshaun Watson. That's unfair. That's a high standard. At the same time, it, it was different. You, you could tell that maybe a year will make a difference. Maybe Kelly can do a little bit better. But, I mean, that remains to be seen because now you're talking if – um God, his name escapes me. But if the true sophomore, who's probably going to be starting for Alabama, messes up, you've got a guy who's played in four college football playoff games behind him, including a national championship game where Alabama wasn't really out of it. Alabama wasn't getting blown out. Alabama wasn't a team that was playing like crap and needed a spark. Nick Saban just went with the who he thought was a hot hand. Dude, like, Alabama might have the best quarterback situation in the entire country. And I can't believe I just said that sentence. Alabama, out of every school, might have the best quarterback situation in the country. You're Ladies starting off. You heard him correctly. He said Alabama has the best quarterback situation. And, and I'm, and I'm going to explain it. You have a true sophomore that won against Georgia in overtime when it clearly looked like Alabama just wasn't clicking. It it was just an SEC slugfest, and the true sophomore proved out to be the difference. Now, you're coming in with him. He's supposed to be, in Nick Saban's eyes, exceedingly better than Jalen Hurd, who's now the backup quarterback, but who has played in the college football playoff every year that he has been on the Crimson Tide. You literally have a backup quarterback who has two or three more years of eligibility is going to stick around this season and not transfer and is sitting behind a true sophomore quarterback who's only played a half of football with the strictest coach and the coldest coach in all the college football land. It's literally a no-risk situation for Nick Saban because when Jalen Hurts gets in, all he's going to want to do is prove himself and prove why the coaching staff made a mistake. 
So he'll play even better than he played the two years Alabama got to a national championship game or the playoff the first year when they lost to Ohio State. So it's really a situation where it's like, you tell me a situation. I don't care about how they looked in high school. I don't care about what kind of stars they had. I don't care how they looked at your little spring game. Tell me a team that has a quarterback that looks that much better than a quarterback who's been to the college football playoff two times. You won't. A lot of teams, maybe every team, when their starter goes down, the season's done. If Alabama's starter goes down, you're basically picking up where you left off last year. And by picking up where you left off last year, that means you were good enough to make the playoff and you didn't even win your conference. And I don't think people understand how significant that really is. So, I mean, Alabama tackles the young boy, flusters him. You put in the experience, Jalen Hurts, who can run the ball. Yeah, the, the true sophomore whose name escapes me all the time is mobile, but Jalen Hurts could be an NFL prospect at running back. Like, Jalen Hurts is experienced. He has laid. A Miami team isn't going to face him at all. He's played in the SEC for a long time, and Miami team isn't going to face him. The true sophomore denied reports, but there was rumors that he was planning on transferring at the end of last season because he didn't think he was ever going to play at Alabama. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, Nick Saban rarely makes mistakes. But you never know with kids that young. You never know with this generation of college players. He might be getting too much too soon. But the fact remains, he's that much better to Nick Saban, who was the Bill Belichick of college football, than a quarterback who's been to the college football playoff every year. You you can't convince me there's somebody with a better quarterback situation. All right. There you have it. From Dallas Glenn himself. Now... Just to let y'all know, every pick in from the NFL and college football will be posted on the website. So just in case you you forgot who we picked, you you can go on the website and you can and you can see who all we picked. The website will be posted along with this with this episode. So with that being said, let's get to some college picks. Damn. Now before we do this, looking at the schedule, Dallas. Okay. Do you have anybody on upset alert this week? Yes, I do. I do. I do. When I when I first saw the game, it just spoke to me. I don't know whether it's because of my day job. I don't know whether I have an affinity for them. Just for some reason, BYU's independent self stood out to me. I think that BYU has been sorry for too long. I think that Arizona their window has closed. I think those two are going to go together. I think BYU is going to be Arizona. Now, Arizona isn't ranked, but when you think about the Pac-12 and when you think of where Arizona has been performing in recent years, all it takes is a couple of weeks and Arizona can make a run for it. I think BYU shuts the whole thing down before it even starts. Now, if you want to... So you're saying Kevin Simlins, first game... As the Wildcat head coach is an L at home. I Here's the thing with BYU. BYU has kind of, sort of, the same issue as Army, Navy, and Air Force, but not to the extent. BYU, you technically don't have to be a Mormon to attend the school. Because of that, BYU, any given year can have a decent season. We're talking like, you know, eight, nine-win season. Arizona is looking like a regular team. I'm thinking that Arizona is regular regular. I'm thinking that BYU is tired of being sorry. BYU has a lot of continuity and consistency, and their players are always a lot more mature for the most part because of the unique way that their school functions. I think that the continuity in coaching – I think that the continuity in personnel, I think they walk in a stable unit that's independent and realizes that they need to start winning games or else they won't have a shot for anything. And they take advantage of an Arizona team that look average, their windows closed, and they got a new coach. Wow. He pulled the trigger. BYU. 
I'm not necessarily picking this team, but I'm putting them on upset alert because it can happen. And I'm putting number 13 Stanford on upset alert as they open up at home tomorrow night against San Diego State. Oof. San Diego State beating Stanford. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's gonna happen. I'm putting them, but do I don't believe Steph is gonna run away with this game. Here, here's why I'll tell you why Arizona is a much more of an upset alert than Stanford. Stanford is a physical team that can run the ball, eat the clock. If push came to shove, Stanford can stop that game in its tracks. Their coach has been coaching that team for a minute. He's been in the Pac-12 for a minute. He knows that the only way to compete in the Pac-12 is to shut down those high-flying offenses, which he can do. I think that he can grind away at a San Diego State team. But here's the thing with BYU-Arizona. Kevin Sumlin has had some of the most high-flying offenses ever. He had a high-flying offense at Houston, had a high-flying offense at Texas A&M. The problem with that, though, is those take more rhythm than people think. It's not just throwing up the ball and having a guy that runs a 4-2 catch it. If you can knock off a passing offense's rhythm, if you can force some third and longs and get them like some three and outs or whatever, I mean, you know, you get a three and out against a passing team, the clock barely stopped. You get a three and out against a running team like Stanford, they took time away from you just like you took time away from them. I think if it come, becomes a dog fight, Stanford knows what to do and can shut San Diego State down and just keep their offense off the field. I think BYU might be able to force some turnovers, get to the passer, and disrupt that passing off. Sounds like you're picking Stanford to win that game. Yeah. It's not a slight against San Diego State. It's literally like I said. I think Stanford has the offense and the defense – to where when their coach sees something like that happening, he can just shut it down and grind it out. He's not going to fall into the trap of trying to shoot it out with a group of five team. All right. So then let's, let's get to some picks now. Tonight, 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 the new era begins at UCF as they open up on the road against American Conference opponent, UConn. Dallas, who you got? UCF. I got UCF. Probably 35-21. 35-21, I think that this is a game where it's in conference, so it does matter. But I think it's, it's, it's just in that range where UCF can work out the kinks and not be too worried about losing. I think for them to lose against UConn, they have to have a terrible game. The team has to just look awful. I don't think the team looks awful. I think that they'll let UConn score. I think that they'll have some miscues, might even have a turnover that UConn capitalizes on. But I think UCF gets through it and wins that game. All right, all right. I'm taking UCF. I'm upset. UCF by 30. All right. The suspension of Urban Meyer begins Saturday as the Black Guys are at home and they open up against the Pac-12's own Oregon State Beavers. I'm taking Ohio. Yeah, I got Ohio State like 42-14. Ooh, you saying it's not even close. Nah. Oregon so, State is going to go 2-10, and, I mean, there, nothing, nothing's really going on over there this time of year for Oregon State. So it's going to be a rough year, and it's going to start with Ohio State. All right, let's move on to an interesting matchup. Lane Kiffin taking the Isles of Florida Atlantic. Up to Norman, Oklahoma to face the Sooners in the Kyle Murray era. Where are you going, Dallas? The CUSA needs to watch out. The CUSA needs to be on red alert. Are they in the Sun Belt? Did they realign Sun- yet? Sun Belt. Uh, even worse. Sun- even even worse. The Sun Belt needs to pray. They need to pray hard. I don't think FAU wins this game, but I think they lose it by one score. I think FAU scares the hell out of Oklahoma. And I think FAU sets the tone that they're going to win the the Sun Belt outright. They're going to win the Sun Belt by a decent margin. Me and Darnell both have UCF as our group of five pick. I think me and Darnell also believe that Boise State is a safe pick. 
this isn't me copping out. This is just me being honest. If Florida Atlantic, I'm picking Oklahoma to win this game. If Florida Atlantic can keep this game within eight points at the final score, watch out because Oklahoma is a pretty damn good loss. Florida Atlantic runs the table after losing to Oklahoma. Who, I, I don't know. They got the conference to do it. That's something about conference is weak. I think if they can hang with Oklahoma, they're going to run through that conference. They're one of the teams to watch for. And I think we listed them as one of our teams to watch for in the group of five episode. I agree. Everything you said, but one thing. What? I'll say Florida landed supply of Oklahoma at halftime. Second half come out, Oklahoma turns into Oklahoma. And Oop, it's a done, done deal. Oop, there it is. I'm saying the first half, Oklahoma get punched in the mouth. They're going to go into halftime. Lincoln Wright going to say, look, First game of the season, y'all, y'all, y'all seen, y'all seen the name Florida Legend and thought and thought it was a cakewalk, right? So what you gonna do in the second half? Second half, they gonna turn to Oklahoma. Oklahoma by twenty. Okay, but you're saying this is a second half twenty. You're saying yes. that it will. Okay, okay, okay. So because see, you have to specify stuff like that in college football because things like this matter when you're splitting straws. Like, you know what I'm saying Florida Land would catch them in the first half, and in the second half they'll. They'll realize, like, okay, this, this is, this is real. So we gotta, we, we gotta play now. And then they'll do what Oklahoma always does. They'll run up the score. Okay. Check this one out. Number twenty three, the Texas Longhorns, going to the land of Maryland, the FedEx Field, to take on the Maryland Terrapins. I've got Tejas. Whoo! I've got Texas, and I'm not even worried about it. I've got yeah. Texas by like maybe a touchdown, but dude, it's Maryland. Maryland has their own issues. We're just not talking about Maryland because they're ass. Maryland has their own issues that they're dealing with. But we've seen this before. Nobody talks about Maryland. All eyes is on Texas, and Maryland caught them. You know, I I I think that Maryland does what we think Ohio State should do. I really think that what they're dealing with off the field right now is too much. They're dealing with a coaching staff that was abusive. They're dealing with a coaching staff that directly led to the death of a teammate. You know, some of those juniors and seniors were teammates with that guy. And, you know, I just, uh-uh. I think that you'll see the student part of student athlete. I definitely don't think Maryland's going to do nothing national wise. I definitely don't think that they're going to beat a team like Texas who's trying to really make a comeback to national prominence. And it's already in the AP top 25. Like, I don't see it. You know what? You just convinced me. I was going to pick Texas. And I was going to say it was going to be a, a, a close game. But what you just said with all that is happening, you reminded me what happened in Maryland. Texas by 25. Yeah. Eh, like, uh, and not even joking. It's I don't think that – not the first week. Maybe they can rebound and catch something. Maybe they can try to fight to get to a bowl game. Maybe they can be like a five or six win team. But no, nah, not the first week. Not the first week against a top 25 team. That's that's just too much to get through. All right. This next game, could this be our first year out of the season? Oh, it will. SEC, Big 12, the old Miss Webbers, taking the trip to Texas to take on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. I'm going on this. You're going to miss. I'm going Texas Tech. Well, I mean, you know, the old so Miss, old Miss is in the SEC West, so they're deceptive. Some people may think Ole Miss and Mississippi State are on the decline, but that's not necessarily true. If people look at history, Ole Miss and Mississippi State usually win their bowl games against non-SEC teams. So you know, don't. Don't let the SEC beating up on Ole Miss and Mississippi State for a couple of years uh, uh, mis- misguide your opinion. I'm not talking about you directly, Darnell. I'm talking about people in general. Don't, don't let it misguide your opinion. What has Texas Tech done, period? They had one year when they had Michael Crabtree and Graham Harrell, and they were number two for a week, and they lost. Ever since then, what have they done? You see, they haven't been nationally been talked about, but – they put up points. 
And they put the points in bunches. So I'm looking at old Miz, I'm like, do you still got that defense? You also got to remember, you also got to remember, Darnell. It's one thing for Ole Miss to not have the defense they have. It's another thing for Ole Miss to have a Big 12 defense. Texas Tech is playing against a group of five teams in the Big 12. They're putting up points in a league where nobody plays defense. You're talking about the first week against an SEC team that still has a chance? Because that's the thing, Darnell. I'm not picking against any SEC team for the first two weeks. Every SEC team has a chance because they haven't played each other yet. I don't see how an SEC team just comes in and loses to a Big 12 team when they still got a shot at the whole thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to change his mind on that because the next two games involve SEC teams. So with the next one being the Chick-fil-A kickoff down in Atlanta, Georgia, number six, the Washington Huskies versus the number nine, Auburn Tigers. Top 10 matchup. Darnell, I said a one-loss Pac-12 team could get in, and you're looking at Stanford or, or Auburn. So which one would you pick for Washington, Stanford or Auburn? I might. You know what? I got Washington winning. I'm going, I'm going to Washington. We got an Auburn coming off a very sour taste in their mouth, and they're basically the only team in the country that can truly go up to Alabama and say that we are a rival. Who first game and and even though it's a neutral site, come on, this isn't the South. It's an SEC territory. You know, you know why I'm picking Washington. Why? Because if you think about it, Washington is a great team. People they on are. people on the East Coast don't know about them because they always playing at ten forty five, eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure Washington is sitting there like y'all gonna know about us Saturday. All right. this ACC, ACC talk and not alone looking at us in the Pac-12, I think they're going to send a message early. I'm not saying you're wrong. It's just <sighs> this is the equivalent of those high school football games where it's, it's supposed to be fair. They scheduled you for homecoming. It's just they've arranged it somehow. This is this isn't the homecoming game per se, but this is just that situation where it's like, this isn't a neutral field. This isn't a neutral field. Alabama is like my second home. I've been in Alabama a lot. And I can tell you right now, nobody in Alabama who's truly a fan of Auburn or Alabama Crimson Tide is going to have a problem traveling to Atlanta. Atlanta is only six hours away from Pensacola. Hell, I can get to Atlanta by the end of the day if I leave right now. They're going to travel. They're going to travel Washington, I mean, God bless them. God bless the student section. God bless the people who got jobs after they graduated on the East Coast and have the money to fly like that. But, man, look, that's still a home game for Auburn. Then you're giving them a big stage like the Chick-fil-A kickoff. I'm sorry. I say that there will be a one-loss Pac-12 champion. I also say that this is one of the best losses for the Atlantic and Washington Week one already have some of the best losses you could possibly have. I don't think LSU versus Miami is a good loss for LSU simply because LSU ain't got a shot. If they can't beat Miami, they ain't got a shot to win the SEC West. And with Michigan Notre Dame, which we'll get to, that's not a good loss because, again, either one of those teams need to beat that other team to even have a shot. Whereas Washington and Auburn, I mean – they can still get there. That being said, I think Auburn in Atlanta, the first game of the season, same coaching staff, I think same quarterback, and they're coming off that loss to UCF. I think they're coming out with hell, fire, and brimstone. I think that this is a good loss for Washington. I'm not saying they'll get blown out. I'm just saying that they need to hang with Auburn because Auburn is around the caliber of what they're going to see in the playoff Anyway, I think that Washington can beat Stanford. I think that Washington can run the table. But whether it's referees or whether it's the stage or whether it's just Auburn being better, I think Auburn wins this game. I'm only saying it's a one-score game. I'm not saying that Auburn's going to run away with it. It's going to be a one-score game. It could be a field goal in the last 20 seconds. 
I'm still saying that Auburn walks out with it. All right, real quick. The next game, Tennessee, West Virginia at rank number 17, neutral side game. ACC Nation will be live at down there for that game. Real quick, who you got? Tennessee. Picking Tennessee. I'm picking West Virginia. Now, let's get to the game of the week. The site where college game day will be at Saturday morning. South Bend, Illinois. Number 14, the Michigan Wolverines. Against number 12, Notre Dame, Fighting Irish. Where you going? Going Notre Dame. It all goes down to... I, I go off of history and track record. I, I don't know if you guys realize, but Darnell, he, he's really into the math, the numbers. He's really into, like, looking forward. I like to look back. And when I look back, Jim Harbaugh has had all the opportunities in the world to show that Michigan is moving forward. But when you look back at the history, Jim Harbaugh, he, he, he doesn't get it done. Jim Harbaugh hasn't even played in the Big 12 championship game. Now, I think, I'm not saying this is a down year for the Big 10. What I'm saying is the field is open. I think that Notre Dame gets this simply because it's a big game. It's the first week of the season. And Jim Harbaugh hasn't shown me anything that says he'll open up against a number 12 Notre Dame, not a 24 Notre Dame. Not an unranked Notre Dame. Not a 19th Notre Dame. A number 12 Notre Dame. 12th ranked means that you can win games and get into the mix by the middle of the season. The AP poll is giving Notre Dame a chance. I think Brian Kelly takes advantage of that chance. Beats Michigan at home. I'm going upset. Like you always say about Jim Howard, the the honeymoon thing is over. Your butt is on the line this season. And what a way to make people in Michigan and people around the nation get a little more comfortable with you being the head man in Michigan and then knocking off Notre Dame in their backyard. Jim Harbaugh, this is your game. I'm going to see if you're going to take it. Now let's little move on to the Camping World kickoff down in Orlando, Florida, where it's the Louisville Cardinals on the ACC going against the National Defending champions from the SEC, Alabama Tide. I don't even know why you put this game on the list. I'm pretty sure both of us are picking Alabama. I I don't even know why you put this game on the list. What's there to talk about? Hey, you never know when it comes to that ACC, SEC games today. Those games get a little crazy. But we're both picking Bama, so we're going to move on. Dallas is upset pick BYU at Arizona. He picked BYU. I'm picking Arizona. Kevin Sumlin would not start his Arizona Wildcat career with a loss to BYU. He was everybody, sneaking with it. Everybody watch the independent teams this year. Watch Army, BYU, and Notre Dame. Notre Dame is the only one who's really going to have a shot to make any national noise. And by national noise, I mean compete for a playoff spot or a New Year's Six Bowl spot. But Army finished with 10 wins last year. And BYU is due. They're due. They're independent. They have their own network. They have bowl tie-ins. Like, watch for BYU. This is one of those games that BYU is, A, going to need to get bowl eligible. But, B, like, I think BYU finishes in the top 25. I think they were 3-8 and eight last year. But I think this win is going to get them on that road. Because, again, let's be fair to Kevin Sumlin. He needs – he, he he can't install his offense, even if it is a Pac-12 team. He can't just install his offense in one offseason. And then God bless him, but he didn't learn how to play SEC defense either. So so there's a lot of stuff he has to get together. BYU ain't the sexy team. They don't do a lot of things pretty. But they can play defense. They can force some turnovers. And their offense usually has a mature quarterback that went on a mission somewhere and is 25 years old that knows how not to throw picks every play. I think ball control is what gets it done, but they still get it done. I think I think with Kelly Summon being gifted with Khalil Tate as his quarterback, I think Khalil Tate is the difference. I mean, I he's gonna be he's he's gonna be the running for my for the Heisman. So I think having Khalil Tate 
It gives Kevin Summerlin that escapability to get away from BYU. Now, something's got to give him this one, Dallas. Yo, ACC, yo, ACC pick the number eight Miami Hurricanes versus the number 25 team, the LSU Tigers. Miami. There you go. He Miami went against by a, 14. By 14. Miami by 14. LSU is coming in 25th. LSU coming in 25th tells me that the AP is like, well, what are all the schools with a reputation? What are all the schools that, you know, they've been there before, they've done it, who are the power five teams, and who are the best teams in the group of five? Literally, all the AP top 25 is, is, okay, let's go through the entire group of five and who's left. I mean, let's go through the entire power five and who's left. LSU made the cut because they're in the SEC. Miami is leagues better than LSU is right now. 14. Mm -hmm. Sunday night, ACC, SEC, round two. Another neutral site. If I'm I'm mistaken, correct, I think this this game will be played in Arlington inside Jerry Jones' billion-dollar plate. And my heart is telling me LSU. But I'm going to go with my mind on this, and I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to pick Miami. Mm. I'm going to pick Miami by 10. And that leads to the final game of the week, and it's on Labor Day, Monday night. A ACC battle up in Tallahassee, Florida. The Virginia Tech Hoogies, ranked number 20th against the number 19th ranked Florida State Seminoles. Mm. And I'm not going to waste no time. I'm going with the Hoagies of Virginia Tech. Florida State is installing a spread offense with a read option. DeAndre Francois is their quarterback and their running back, who was the highest rated player on pro football focus's college football rankings, is coming back too. Y'all can have fun with that Virginia Tech, Florida State at home, maybe 21. Florida State big. All right. I like it. There you have it. All our picks are in. That's all the time we got for today. Remember, all the picks will be on the website. We're going to go ahead and look ahead to tomorrow. Dallas, what's coming up tomorrow? Okay, so, you know, I've really been trying to figure out what's going on here. I've been trying to compare WWE's booking and WWE's on-screen product with other promotions and I've been trying to like really really break down what's going on and why I think now I know we usually talk about storylines and how we feel but like I I think I legitimately have an explanation as to why things are the way they are now it may not be fun to some people it may not be what you traditionally think a wrestling podcast should be, but I think that it's no fun when all we do is what all 100,000 other wrestling podcasts do, which is get mad at WWE and try to figure out why they didn't book people we think they should book. I have actual reasons. They're shoot reasons for people who think they're smart but don't know what shoot means. They're real reasons. They're tangible reasons. And I think that is going to explain why things are the way they are. Again, will you like it? Probably not. But it's probably the best explanation we're going to get. Until tomorrow. Later.